Hello everyone, welcome to Ideas and Insights. I am Badri Nath Rao, your host for this program. One of the worst kept secrets of America, hidden in plain sight, is how it treats some of the most vulnerable segments of its population. The shibboleth of freedom notwithstanding, we hold the detestable distinction of being a hypercarceral state. 2.3 million Americans are in prisons across the country, and almost a million enter prisons annually. According to Bill Keller, acclaimed journalist and founding editor in chief of the Marshall Project, a nonprofit news organization that covers criminal justice issues, our incarceration rate per 100,000 population is roughly twice that of Russia's and Iran's, four times that of Mexico's, five times uh, England's, six times Canada's, nine times Germany's, and 17 times Japan's. One third of Americans have a criminal record a number equal to the percentage of Americans with a college degree. A disproportionate percentage of our prisoners is black and brown. One in three black men has a felony conviction. An equal number are likely to go to prison during their lifetime. Instead of outraging our justice sensibilities, these statistics fortify our belief that blackness is synonymous with criminality. Generally speaking, most educated folks have a nebulous idea of the problem of mass incarceration. Though somewhat disturbing, the popular consensus is that mass imprisonment betokens the efficient functioning of the justice system. We revel in a respect for the rule of law. Our worldview is predicated on the idea that individuals must be held accountable for their crimes and that imprisonment is a legitimate form of punishment. Wedded to a law and order framework that emphasizes incapacitation and deterrence, we fail to recognize that our justice system is retributive. Our law enforcement is racially targeted and our penal policies are brutalizing and insensitive to human suffering. The scourge of burgeoning incarceration barely makes a dent in our thinking because we harbor unexamined notions of criminality as attributes of individuals. Popular wisdom insulates us from the structural factors that ineluctably propel people to acts of deviance. Besides, we ignore the larger, less obvious, but equally insidious impact of imprisonment on our prisoners, their loved ones, and society. A related question that barely crosses our mind concerns proportionality. Fairness demands that punishment must be commensurate with the crime. After serving time in prison, Convicts must be able to rebuild their lives and move on. Life after prison, most former prisoners discover, is fraught with impediments every step of the way. Blighted by the stigma of conviction, ostracized by society, with few economic prospects, former prisoners struggle for survival. A majority of released prisoners return to prison in 36 months, just as reprehensible as the crimes people commit, is our unwillingness to accord dignity and enabling opportunities to people swept up by oppressive forces often beyond their control. A new book, Stolen Wealth, Hidden Power, The Case for Reparations for Mass Incarceration published by the University of California Press this year, offers an illuminating account of the devastation caused by mass incarceration. 
in black communities across the country. Its author, Dr. Tesselli McKay, is a National Science Foundation postdoctoral research fellow at Duke University and an affiliate of RTI International, a nonprofit policy research organization in North Carolina. She argues that mass incarceration is a form of collective violence that affects not just prisoners, but their families, children, and whole communities. Dr. McKay has painstakingly examined the ruinous socioeconomic and psychological consequences of mass incarceration after President Lyndon Johnson unveiled tough on crime policies in the 1960s. She posits that the economic value of the damages to black individuals, families, and communities caused by these policies totals 7.16 trillion, roughly 86% of the current black-white wealth gap. Dr. McKay's book is based on unimpeachable empirical evidence and interviews with 1,991 incarcerated men and 1,482 of their female identified intimate or co-parenting partners. Among a plethora of books on mass incarceration, Dr. McKay's work stands out as a superb work of scholarship for several reasons. First, imbued by transitional justice, focusing on healing, closure, and transformation. She makes a convincing case for reparations and restitution of $7.16 trillion. Feasibility aside, this meticulous claim, buttressed by unassailable evidence, jolts readers into a new awareness of the destructive power of mindless warehousing of people. Second, Dr. McKay's perceptive ethnographic account of the myriad facets of mass incarceration brings us face to face with our limitless capacity to inflict violence on those we wish to dominate. She points out that every imprisoned person is sent away for life and that convicts are never free. Dr. McKay delineates the challenges former prisoners face when they seek work and try to reintegrate into society. Third, stolen wealth, hidden power, sheds light on the often overlooked impact of incarceration on women and children. In a nuanced analysis, Dr. McKay sheds light on how even as we individualize culpability, we impose punishment that goes beyond the individual and diminishes their loved ones. Women bear the brunt of the systemic burden imposed by mass incarceration and sustain it through their invisible and coerced labor. Aside from the pressures of unremitting work and single parenting, partners of incarcerated men endure social isolation, extreme loneliness, and depression. Fourth, aside from restitution, Dr. McKay advocates educational reforms, trauma-sensitive law enforcement and correctional officer protocols, robust psychosocial support to cope with the agony of imprisonment, and monthly or lump sum cash payments for victims and their families. Dr. McKay joins me now to discuss these ideas. Welcome to Ideas and Insights, Dr. McKay. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you. It's a real joy to be here. Let's begin with a question where I play the devil's advocate. Your book is a fervent plea for reparations for mass incarceration, and you also 
want prisons to be humane in how they treat prisoners. As horrible as conditions are in prisons across the country, one might say that people go to prison because they have committed crimes. In other words, that it is deserved. Making prisons comfortable will perhaps, albeit unwittingly, give people incentive to commit crimes. In other words, the whole point of prison is to inflict pain. And so your argument for reparations and making prisons decent and humane might seem somewhat odd to some readers of your book and viewers of this program. What do you have to say? Indeed, that's such an important question. Um, and, and, you know, first I might go even further to say that I'm not sure there is a humane prison um, and, and that what you said earlier in your comments really resonates for me that I think we need to actually go beyond thinking about making prisons more humane into considering whether imprisonment as a response to criminalized activity is humane in itself. I really aim to question that very premise. And um, as to, you know, the, the broader question of don't folks who have done something that's against the law deserve to be punished? Don't we risk encouraging more behavior that's against the law if we fail mm -hmm. to strongly punish that behavior? Um, I, I think the heart of this is twofold. One has everything to do with the structural issues you raised that everyone from criminal criminologists to political philosophers is increasingly recognizing that it's illogical to individualize responsibility for crime with our current social scientific understanding of the etiology of the origins of engagement in crime, which are largely social and structural and not individual. And so that's that's one piece. The second is that um, one of the things I hope to show with crystal clarity in the book is that even for folks who do believe that a person commits a crime and they deserve a punishment. And, and even if you're out there believing that someone who commits a horrible crime mm -hmm. deserves the most horrible possible punishment, what I would say is that the social scientific evidence now points indisputably to the reality that the overwhelming majority of the punishments that we're imposing under this hypercarceral system are not even born by the individuals convicted of crime. They are born by people unconvicted, the partners, mothers, co-parents, children, neighbors, broader communities that's when when you add up the numbers part of what's so powerful is that as you noted we are our whole system is predicated on the idea that we're somehow holding individuals responsible for their individual actions and yet we know definitively that the punishments that we're imposing, and particularly the decision to impose incarceration, mm -hmm. whether in using jails or using prisons, the decision to impose incarceration reverberates out far beyond the focal individual. So if even if we're looking to punish individuals, even if that's the goal at the end of the day, that's not what we're doing. And what we're doing, in fact, delegitimizes the entire system. And I would argue promotes rather than inhibits the kinds of harmful behavior that we're supposedly deterring. Dr. McKay, you've raised a number of uh, points in your response and we will take them up one by one. Let me ask you a quick follow-up question. 
early in your book, you say that the whole notion of criminality is a weapon of social exclusion. You are, I'm sure, aware that there are a lot of people who will have issues with this point because, again, they are likely to maintain that criminal behavior is a choice that individuals exercise. And when someone resorts to an act of crime, they voluntarily remove themselves from the pale of society. How then can one say that criminality is a weapon of social exclusion? Well, this is something where I think the field of behavioral economics has a lot to teach us. Essentially, what we know is that individual behavior absolutely is governed by individual choice, mm -hmm. moment to moment. No one would dispute that. What we recognize increasingly as social scientists is that the set of constraints and support within which any given individual, given community mm -hmm. exercises those choices varies tremendously. Now, behavioral economics has largely focused on um, smaller forms of social engineering, deliberate social engineering. You know, how can we make it easier for someone to participate in a pro-social program that's we believe is productive and positive for them. Um, but what the lesson that I take from that field more broadly is that we are living inside an incredible feat of social engineering in which your choices and my choices look quite different from one another and vastly different from folks in communities like the ones on which my book focuses. And so absolutely, we each exercise individual choices, but we all know from our personal life experience that the context in which we're making a decision influences the decision greatly. If, if I ask you, is it okay to punch someone in the face? You might say, no. If I say, okay, but, but, is it okay to punch someone in the face if they have just ripped your two-year-old child out of your arms and they're running away with them? You'd probably say yes, which is just to illustrate the point. Every one of our decisions is made under a particular set of opportunities and constraints, and those differ structurally and systematically. And that's what we have to look at when we talk about collectivizing responsibility for violence. Now, you realize, Dr. McKay, don't you, that the argument you're making is profoundly counterintuitive for most people. Because, as you note in your book, our sense of our worth and our deservingness, our notions of crime and culpability, and our propensity to view punishment as something that an individual should go through. All of these ideas are deeply embedded in our consciousness. And what you're saying is profoundly against the grain. And so are we trying to convince people of something that they may never come around to believe, or do you think that there will soon be a time when people will understand that though seemingly individuals make choices, these choices are governed by forces beyond their control? It's, it's really the question you're asking is the question of our times. You know, I uh -huh. think that questions of mass incarceration, of prison abolition, of reparations are really among the foremost moral and political choices that we will collectively make Correct. in our lifetimes. And I think the answer to your question, you know, which way will we go? 
is yet to be determined. That's in part Mm -hmm. why I wrote the book, because I think in this moment, it is possible that we will turn this ship in the right direction um, and begin on a better course. And, and I love what you raised about um, how deeply we have internalized the idea of criminality and non-criminality as Correct. core to our moral fabric. And I guess what I want to add is I hope for us collectively, regardless of where we are on the political spectrum, what I hope is that we can all raise the bar, that we can live to a higher moral standard than I'm a good person because I am abstaining from crime and because that person over there isn't. That's a very low threshold for living a moral existence. I want to raise the bar and say, collectively, if, if, if we feel so strongly about taking responsibility, if we feel so strongly about right and wrong, we need to step up to a higher level of moral and collective responsibility that would include ending the collective violence that each of us is complicit in currently and repairing the damage that each of us has been complicit in perpetrating as part of the collective. Let's now move to your account of the genesis of mass incarcerations. You trace it to the tough on crime policies of the Lyndon B. Johnson administration and the Nixon administration that followed. Can you tell us why these administrations pursued tough on crime policies, what the consequences were, and more importantly, why didn't subsequent administrations recognize the colossal damage that these policies were causing in black communities and try to reverse them? You know, so many people are asking that first question, and I don't hear anyone asking the second question that you asked. I really appreciate that. So as for the first, you know, it's incredibly complex uh -huh. how mass incarceration unfolded, but one thing that's quite clear from political science and historical research is that the advent of incarceration was not a logical response to increases in criminalized activity, um, nor has it been effective. Um, and yet it, it's been, um, it, instituted even you know at the time that the um, state and federal legislator started passing laws that were increasingly harsh on crime that increasingly locked people up for long periods the national academies of scientists had just released a report saying that this was a, a not substantiated by evidence it appeared to be a very poor approach to criminalized activity and so we know from what historians and political scientists have pieced together since that it was very politically motivated and very racially motivated. And the individual actors involved, various presidents, legislators, um, policymakers, some had exclusively political motivations, some had racial motivations, some had both. But we know that um, ensuring uh, ongoing political domination of folks who were in power and particularly of reinforcing white political power, um, we know that those goals were key in the rise of mass incarceration. But to your second question, which I love just because I don't right. hear um, folks asking it, why haven't we done anything about it, um, including in subsequent more liberal administrations. Right. Um, I think it's that the rewards of continuing to promote a harsh on crime policy and the punishment, politically speaking, for not promoting tough on crime policies has been too great. And this that why that's the case goes back to the really core 
Um, I think moral issues that you raised a few moments ago, you know, we as an American public have really internalized this idea of that if we maintain a sense of otherness Mm -hmm. of folks who engage in criminal activity um, disproportionately, low income folks of color in in our um, spectral imagination of what and who is criminal, then we get the cheap gratification of thinking that we are good and right for merely doing nothing at all. And and that's why I say, you know, um, I think people on the right want to associate a position of prison abolition or of reparations or or of, um, you know, defunding the police mm-hmm. um, as being as promoting lawlessness and amorality. Uh, and I would say just the opposite. We need to ask more of ourselves as moral beings and not take the cheap out of um, the specter of criminality that lets the rest of us who are not in contact with the criminal legal system for folks like me, because of often reasons of race and gender, at least as much as um, reasons of individual choice or behavior. um, And stop patting ourselves on the back for those things we we need to really to use a right-wing rhetoric um be individually morally self-sufficient rather than relying on this trope of criminality you make a compelling case in your book dr mckay for reparations for mass incarceration based on principles of transitional justice can you tell us briefly the ethical, legal, and philosophical justifications for making restitutions for mass incarceration? Absolutely. And I think that this question is important because um, so many folks, you know, we've talked about kind of where folks on the political right might come to this issue. Right. Folks on the political left tend to this tend to come to this issue almost with a shrug, with throwing our hands up in the air to ask, uh, what could we even do to make this better? Um, this uh, we have such a terrible history in this mm-hmm. country of racial injustice that some folks on the left want to just throw up our hands and say, well, b- but how could we even make that right? And what what we know from transitional justice, and this is a, a global field, you know, Yugoslavia, Rwanda, sure. South Africa, Chile, Argentina, I could name and name and name countries that have implemented massive transitional justice processes after mass atrocity, particularly mass racial atrocity. And we know from that legal and political and philosophical record that essentially recovery from those kinds of atrocities takes three things. We need to develop a shared collective understanding of what's actually happened. Mm -hmm. We need to reform institutions that have been harnessed for abusive ends, and we need to make material reparations. That sounds like a lot, but the good news is, you know, for all the folks out there who might feel like this is an impossible task or or even that more broadly racial equity in the united states is far out of reach i would say absolutely not it is possible we haven't really tried yet even if one concedes your arguments some might quibble and say look if we take the path of reparations, we will be opening the floodgates of massive demands for reparations and restitution from communities both at home and abroad. And it will soon spin out of control. Mm. What do you say to that? I say that I would welcome a coming time in which we expand 
not only our ability to comprehend the vastness of harm that we have inflicted upon each other, Mm -hmm. but stretch our understanding of our capacity for repair. And that's a big thing that I set out to do in the book to say, yes, this is a vast harm. And in fact, even a harm as vast as this one is reparable. Our remaining in society together at such a mass scale as we have in the United States and through such incredible epics of mass Mm -hmm. atrocity demands it. If we wish to have a future, it must be a future in which we have learned how to make things right at this scale. Dr. Mecke, you have come up with a staggering figure $7.6 $7.6 trillion as the amount of money owed to black communities affected disproportionately by mass incarceration. Can you tell us how you arrived at this massive number? What's the basis for the $7.6 trillion that you mentioned in your book? Yes, I'm so glad you asked because it was a lot of work. It took me five years. I see that you you, you um, work very hard. And, and what I what's amazing about that figure is that um, that it's not even a fully exhaustive estimate, or I would say it's a lower bound because a, one decision I made very early on um, in terms of my method was to limit the harms whose economic value right. I totaled only to those on which I had several pieces of rigorous evidence. And so, you know, all of, there are many other harms that um, have been written about, even in the peer-reviewed social scientific literature that I excluded completely from this work because right. I was only willing to tally up the economic value of harms for which I knew um, that the harm was attributable not just to uh, incarceration itself, but in which I could isolate the effects of racially disproportionate incarceration. And that's important because of the earlier point. You know, some people may feel that incarceration is a, a, a social policy that they don't disagree with. For those people, what I would say is that's fine you don't actually have to disagree with incarceration or even with mass incarceration. My estimates focus on racially Mm -hmm. excess, um, policing, arrest, jailing, imprisonment. Um, And so if you believe that Americans deserve to not be treated differently because of the color of their skin. And I think, honestly, most of us across the political spectrum, not all, but most of us believe in that extremely basement level Uh version of equity. Um, We do need to make right the harm that we have done from racially targeted Mm -hmm. and disproportionate carceral machinery. And so anyway, the way I did it was different in in each chapter. I sort of isolated the life cycle of incarceration. So I looked at, oh, I'm sorry, I should say one more important thing for the skeptic out there, which is that I also did not include in my estimate harms associated with the legally imposed punishment. So again, you can, if you think that perfectly legitimate, someone is convicted of a crime, the judge imposed a punishment, and they deserve to serve that sentence, I say, okay, in this book, I'm not arguing with you about that. What I am arguing is about all of the punitive um, consequences that are suffered by people after they have served their legally imposed sentence that are suffered by people in the lives of those people who had nothing to do 
with the criminalized action that is supposedly being punished by people who live in those same communities who are suffering the fallout. Um, and so what's amazing about the, the social scientific record on this issue is that even subsetting mm -hmm. to those issues, we have enough evidence to say, um, this is the dollar value of harm that has been meted out due to racially disproportionate criminal legal system um, enforcement and beyond the legally imposed punishment. So those are the harms that I focus on in the book. And I really hope that the average person would relate to the idea that those are unjust and that they really do deserve um, restitution. Your book offers a detailed analysis of the impact of mass incarceration on children, youth, women, and whole communities. And you point out that the lives of people belonging to certain communities, blacks, for instance, Latinos, and so on, are affected by surveillance, sanctions, and social inclusion. And you trace how these forces make one move from childhood to adulthood and morph into, quote unquote, a criminal. And you talk about the criminalization of childhood itself. Can you tell us more about how mass incarceration uh, affects children and youth? Thank you, yes. I, one of the things that I think we have failed to recognize is mm -hmm. how completely we have reshaped what childhood is for vast numbers of black and brown children in communities targeted for mass incarceration. You know, we think if you ask the average person, who's the target of mass incarceration? Who's suffered, right? We have a particular image. And what we're not picturing is American childhood itself mm -hmm. has been transformed by this massive social engineering project that we call mass incarceration. The things that we think of as essential to childhood, um, being protected, um, being able to focus on learning, having a parent or parents there to care for you, right? These just basic aspects of our image of like what childhood is are just not true in vast segments of the American population that have been targeted for mass incarceration. And, you know, again, even if you're a fan of imprisonment, mm -hmm. I hope that you're also a fan of childhood. Um, I hope <laughs> that all of us can agree that children all deserve the same opportunity mm -hmm. for learning, for having parents there to nurture them, for being housed, for being protected from violence. And what we don't realize is that the collateral effect of mass incarceration has been so profound as to just reshape that experience completely. That, that what we think of as childhood may be no more than like mm -hmm. an old Norman Rockwell painting as far as children in many of America's communities are concerned. Contrary to popular perception that mass incarceration is all about shutting up uh, prisoners for a certain period of time, you point out two very significant but less understood consequences of mass incarceration. You say that all imprisonment, regardless of the length of the sentence, is for life. And you also say that when a person gets sent to prison, that individual's loved ones, the wife, the children, and so on, also are colossally affected by the sentence, almost to the point where Although technically they are outside, they too 
are in a prison of sorts. Now, I thought these two were very revealing insights. Can you tell us more about them, please? Oh, thanks so much. And and I'm so indebted to both Ruben Jonathan Miller and Megan Comfort for their related works on each in each of those areas, which are beautiful um, for folks who are interested in in exploring those ideas more. But yes, I mean, what I found in looking at the hard numbers, and I think that's mm -hmm. part of what my work adds to this picture, is um, just how staggering, you know, I think we knew, at, at least those of us um, working in, say, sociology, criminology, um, political science, mm -hmm. um, on issues of incarceration, you know, we thought we knew that there was an also there, right? That, that um, you know, incarceration happens, that's the main event. And then on the side, yes, these, these other negative things may also happen. You know, reentry into the community, that can also be rough. Right. You know, people who are released from prison, they may continue to have a hard time. And, and yeah, also on the side, you know, the families and the children. But we kind of thought of these as uh, peripheral consequences. And I think that part of what putting economic estimates into the mix does is helps us to comprehend that in fact it is the legally imposed punishment of the convicted person itself that is tiny in comparison with all of these other reverberating consequences. I mean, there's a fascinating finding and and, and about 10 years ago, mm -hmm. uh, Chris Wildeman, the demographer, found a very strange thing um, a very strange development in American demography, which was that as the black male incarceration rate rose steeply, as it began to do, you mm -hmm. know, 40 or so years ago, he looked at, uh, as a demographer, how does that affect life expectancy? How does that right. affect infant mortality rates um, globally? Not globally, but um, uh, as a population, as an entire American population. What he found was a little strange at the time. As you steeply increase the black male incarceration rate, you see a little bit of change in um, black male life expectancy. Mm -hmm. Where you see a huge change is in infant mortality mm -hmm. and in black women's life expectancy. And at the time, I don't think this finding got the attention it deserved because people did not know what to make of it. It was so paradoxical. And I think putting the economic figures alongside the demographic figures, we can start to make sense of what's happening here to say that, you know, because of, um, in particular, women's invisible labor in, in different sex couples and households, because of how deeply interdependent children are and how affected they are by their parents' well-being, mm -hmm. that it's these aren't little side consequences that women and children bear. They may, in fact, be the worst damage we have done. Let me ask you uh, about the impact of mass incarceration on women. You spoke briefly about it uh, while answering the previous question, but I want to probe further. You say and this is a very perceptive comment I must point out, that it is invisible and coerced female labor that is sustaining this massive structure of the carceral state. And women yes. also I mean, bear the burden of uh, taking care of their partners after they come out of prison, while they are in prison too, and after they come out and doing the legal intermediation, single parenting, this whole thing affects women in ways that can only be described as utterly brutal. And I don't recall any other work that has focused on this less known aspect of how mass incarceration affects women who are technically not in prison, but their lives are worse than 
being in prison. Can you tell us more about this, please? Absolutely. I mean, I, I think that one of the most uh, one of the least recognized, most silent Correct. Uh, harms of mass incarceration has been not simply the mass incarceration mm -hmm. of primarily men, but the mass conscription mm -hmm. of women as unpaid caseworkers, housekeepers, wardens for the state. Right. Women have been on a mass scale conscripted mm -hmm. into doing the state's work for it. And absolutely, you know, uh, many folks, particularly at the level of state government, but also federal government, have started to talk about how incredibly expensive mass incarceration is. And it is. I, I won't disagree with that. But they're focusing on the direct costs to the state. Right. And they're saying that those direct costs of the state are already untenable. What I would add is mm -hmm. the only way the state can even sustain mass incarceration is by offloading the majority of its costs onto unpaid workers who are coerced into providing this uncompensated support, often at great harm. To right. themselves at great documented harm to their own physical well-being to their own economic stability the housing stability of their households and their children at great personal cost because the state essentially is holding their partners and family members ransom mm -hmm. they they don't even have a free choice to make about whether to provide this support and that's why i i think it's not an exaggeration to use the term mass conscription to think about how the state has exploited and demanded women's unfree labor to support this huge apparatus of mass incarceration. Dr. Meke, you make an interesting point in your book while talking about the impact of mass incarceration on women and children. Uh, you uh, invoke uh, criminologist Professor Carolyn Lansky's notion of the referred pain of imprisonment. And you explain how, though culpability is fixed at the individual level, punishment is structured such that its toxic influences radiate across prison walls and affect women and children in the family. I thought this was a very interesting point. Can you explain this, please? Well, I don't think I could put it better than you did so concisely. What I would add is just that um, we need to really take seriously mm -hmm. what an indictment this is of the legitimacy of our entire system. And we live in a time where the legitimacy of our criminal legal system is really in question. You know, we, over the last two years, we have seen by far the largest protests in all of American history mm -hmm. over questions of the legitimacy of our criminal legal system. We have to take these questions seriously. And at the core of that really, is questioning whether we can really have a just system that imposes punishments on unconvicted people. I think all of us need to sit with that question. Dr. Meke, I am running out of time. I have two quick questions. You uh, have spoken about how mass incarceration affects the larger community. And that, I think, is a very important uh, strength of your book because most of us who have had the good fortune of not having anything to do with prison seem to externalize the problem and think that this affects others, not me. But you're saying, no, mass incarceration leads to racial inequality. It leads to infant mortality. It affects uh, uh, longevity, lifespan, and so on. Can you briefly... Tell us how mass incarceration affects all of us in society. 
Absolutely. I, I mean, I think a huge um, part of the insidious damage of mass incarceration has to do with the way that it eviscerates our social institutions and our public institutions sort of from the from the most local uh -huh. and small uh the family level community institutions and organizations and then out from there school systems hospital systems and out from there you know our well-being as an entire population again the the scientific evidence on this is really clear and convincing. It's just Correct. that we don't always look at it all in one place. Um, most people working on this are focused on one little part of it. And when we put it together, it's really a devastating picture. We have silently remade our entire society and um, the the unintended consequences of mass incarceration are far greater even than the intended or obvious ones. Um, and that's part of why repair is so critical, right? Correct. Regardless of where you think we should go from here, if we don't repair the damage we've done, the future is determined just by the momentum of the past not by the policies we set out now. If we continue to move forward as if those harms didn't happen or as if they're irreparable, we might as well stop making public policy altogether because so much of what's happening is simply the momentum of the harms we've already caused. We need to repair them so that we can have agency as a public in determining the present and the future we want from here. Dr. Mecke, I'm almost completely out of time, but I must ask you this. Aside from uh, reparations, you have discussed a slew of concrete strategies for redressing the damages caused by uh, mass incarceration. Can you very, very briefly talk about the most important ones that you've discussed in the book. Absolutely. I, I mean, we need to remake the abusive institutions that ha have been sort of harnessed to the ends of mass incarceration. And, you know, schools, for mm -hmm. example, are a core social institution. The good they do is an essential public good and schools as an institution have been so distorted through the pipelining of youth into the criminal legal system we must make fundamental reforms and repairs to for example public education in this country um the same is true in housing and healthcare. Um, but i would really lift up um repairing and remaking our educational systems as key. And and part of the good news is, you know, if, if we stop paying for incarceration at the scale that we currently are, we could afford vast, vast improvements, changes, reshaping of those institutions. And that's part of what I lay out in the book. You know, this is huge and it's feasible. Dr. McKay, you end your book by making a fervent plea for moving from what you call retributive justice to redistributive justice. You suggest a number of structural changes, we've talked about them, but it seems to me that one of the most insuperable changes, if I may put it that way, that we need to uh, tackle has to do with the attitudes of people. There has to be a shift in people's attitudes toward those that commit crime, towards notions of deviance, punishment, and so on and so forth. How do you think, again, very briefly, can we bring about this attitudinal change? It's a critical question. And again, this is where I think the global transitional justice record is right. so helpful because one of the things we know about mass racial atrocity like mass incarceration but but there have been many versions of mass racial atrocity all over the world in different historical periods and one of the things we know 
is that a fundamental characteristic of mass racial atrocity is that members of the non-targeted racial groups are largely oblivious to what's happened. They are systematically insulated from a real understanding of what's happened. And and we know this in the U.S. because, um, you know, when, when we, when, political scientists do studies to try to predict people's attitudes toward various contemporary policies, you know, like reparations aimed at um, redistributive justice. Um, Those attitudes are heavily, heavily um, divergent by race. And you know what explains the difference? Deficits in white Americans' factual knowledge of American history. (laughs) You are right. You are right. On that note, Dr. McKay, we have to end this conversation. Thank you so much for your time. I appreciate you are sharing your insights with me, and I applaud you for writing a wonderful book. Thank you once again. I'm so grateful for your thoughtful questions. It's been a really stimulating, fantastic conversation and a joy to be here with you. Thank you. That's it for this episode of Ideas and Insights. Thanks for joining us today. In the coming weeks, We will discuss what do you want out of life, a philosophical guide to figuring out what matters, written by Professor Valerie Tiberius. Published by Princeton University Press this year, What Do You Want Out of Life is a guide to living well by understanding better what you value and what to do when your goals conflict. The things we care about in life, family, friendship, leisure activities, work, and our moral ideals often conflict, preventing us from doing what matters most to us. Even worse, we don't always know what we really want or how to define success. Professor Valerie Tiberius, author of what do you want out of life introduces us to a way of thinking about our goals that enables us to reflect on them effectively throughout our life. The book emphasizes the importance of interconnectedness, reminding us of the profound influence others have on our lives and goals and how we should pursue them. Watch out for an exciting discussion in the coming weeks. Until then, stay safe and goodbye.